Hi, this is Hao Wu, the director of All You My Family. You are listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Consoli. I am the director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Today we discuss directing a documentary with Hao Wu, director of the Netflix original documentary, All in My Family. Hao shares his experience selling a documentary to Netflix, resources that documentary filmmakers can use for their projects, tips that could help you sell your documentary, and so much more. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, Hedge.Video, Shutterstock, Magnanimous Rentals, and PremiumBeat.com. Well, we've got a great one for you guys today. How Wu is on the show to talk about his new film, All in My Family. It's a documentary, and he gives us tips on how he actually got the documentary sold. You get a little bit of behind the scenes on all the negotiations to make that happen. And uh, lots of information that I think is going to help you uh, with your own project. So this is an episode not to miss, and you guys are going to love it. But of course, we need to talk about Hedge.video before we get to the interview. Hedge is a backup software for filmmakers. It's fast, it's easy, it's intuitive. You can import multiple sources and send it to multiple destinations all at the same time. So it's perfect for creating multiple backups on set. So I I get all my media cards, I throw it in the uh, source section, and then I have my two hard drives that I back up to, throw that in destinations, press transfer, and I just let it go. The best part is I've got the Hedge Connect app for my phone, so I get an update on my phone when the transfer is done. So I don't have to think about it. And it's done as fast as possible. It's done accurately, so no worry. It's stress-free experience, and that's what I love about those guys. It's professional software for professionals. You get a 20% off discount simply by typing Go Creative Show in the coupon code at checkout. So take a look at it for yourself at hedge.video forward slash Go Creative Show. All right, let's jump into our interview. There's so much to talk about with How Wu. So I'm here with Hao Wu. He is the director of the new Netflix documentary, All in My Family, which was such a great film. Uh, I just saw it this morning, and I'm so excited to have you on How to Talk About It. Glad to be here. So just for the people that maybe not be familiar or maybe aren't familiar with the movie, could you just tell us what is the film about? Yeah, so in All in My Family, All in My Family is a very personal documentary. Uh, In the film, I documented the process for me and my partner to have kids through surrogacy and, uh, you know, how my parents and relative back in China reacted to, you know, my decision to have kids and later on, uh, how we're going to explain the kids to other relatives like my grandpa who's in his 90s and who, you know, still don't know about me being gay. Now, I think it's it's a really interesting story. Um, Now, you know, this is something that is more and more common in the U.S., Um, but if you are not familiar with Chinese culture like I am not, uh, it was interesting to see how affected the family was by this. Um, Not to say that people in families here in the U.S. aren't affected in similar ways, but especially being in Boston, uh, you know, it's it's a liberal area. You see this quite a bit. But I'd love to just take a couple minutes here and just give the audience a little bit of insight into what the culture was in your family and why this was such a dramatic thing for them to deal with. I I think the challenge for my family has always been, first of all, me being gay. And secondly, how they can tell their friends and relatives about the fact that I'm gay. Uh, I think for, uh, you know, China is still a very traditional and conservative country in that uh, uh, a lot of the queer people, LGBTQ community members, um, they they still find it very difficult to come out to their family, not because because of any religious reason, just because uh, the, 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 the entire Confucian society is so focused on procreation and you know, bringing offspring to the family to, to, you know, to continue the family line or the family names. So, uh, you know, queer people are under tremendous pressure not to come out, even though in major, major cities, uh, there's a vibrant subculture, um, queer subculture already. Um, so the 
LGBT people, they can meet online, they can go to gay bars uh, in big city like Beijing or Shanghai, but back home, they tend not to come out. And where is back home for you? Um, I grew up in Chengdu. It's arguably a big city. Uh, it's the capital of the Sichuan province in southwest part of China. So it's a big city already. But then, you know, my family, they came, they grew up in a very different time uh, yeah. compared to me. So for, for them, they, they had never heard of homosexuality before I came out to them. Now, there was something in the film, that, I'm trying to remember the exact language because it really did strike me, but it was something about uh, your mother was talking to you and it was, she was saying something about like her expectations were that you were just going to remain single and make a lot of money. And that was going to be your life like that. There was a lot of focus on money and there was a lot of focus on you being single. But this idea of being in a, in a relationship and having a child was something extraordinarily difficult for her. Um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because it almost seems like there was a basic, ex like she basically accepted you being gay, but not the decision to have a child. That, that's absolutely right. So at the beginning, my mom, first of all, when I came out to my mom, it took her a number of years before she could even accept the fact that I'm different. I'm not going to uh, get married and have a kid. Uh, so when I first told her that my decision to have a kid with my same-sex partner, she was shocked because to for her, uh, the kind of relationship I had uh, was, quote unquote, abnormal. Uh, in the Chinese society, uh, being normal, being just like everybody else is very important uh, for a lot of people in that culture. So my mom would rather me just have saved a lot of money and, you know, be able to afford to go to an upscale, in her words, upscale retirement home. I die alone, uh, you know, right? She rather me do that than to have a kiss with my partner. And something else that uh, was striking me as I was listening to, you know, watching the movie is that there was this big emphasis on making sure that your family is proud, your ancestors are proud. It's something I, I never really hear, you know, in, in my family, yeah. we don't talk about ancestors. We don't, we don't think about it. It's not even something that's that's in our, you know, vocabulary as we're yeah. discussing what we're the decisions we make. But that was a big thing that was spoken about a lot in your documentaries. This idea of making the ancestors proud. Yeah, I mean, uh, Confucian culture. Uh, some some people say Conf Confucianism is uh, a big part of it is about ancestor worship uh, because we, you know, even though in China we had Taoism, we had Buddhism. Uh, as different religions, but then I think the ancestor worship in Confucianism and also to behave yourself, quote unquote, normally, respectfully in the bigger society, that's of paramount importance. So that's why the, the society emphasizes so much about how to make the you know ancestor, the extended family proud and how to um, just get married, and have good jobs, be quote unquote, uh, having a successful career and then have kids. That's what a Chinese person is supposed to do. How did they react to your decision to become a filmmaker? I mean, that must be sort of off the beaten track, too. Yeah, I mean, it was challenging. Even nowadays, my, you know, I've been a um, full-time filmmaker since 2011. 2011. Even nowadays, whenever I see my parents, they still ask me, when, gonna, when are you going to stop doing this and go back <laughs> to have a real job making real money? Really? Yeah. yeah. It's hard. I mean, for them to, uh, it just, in, my parents grew up in a different time. They grew up, uh, they experienced the Great Famine uh, in, in the uh, late 1950s. So for them to, to, survival is very important to be able to improve the family's financial, um, um, financial income was of paramount importance to them. So they honestly couldn't understand why I would give up my lucrative job to become a, you know, independent film, documentary filmmaker. Hmm. What were you doing before? I, I was in the high-tech uh, industry. I worked for companies like uh, Yahoo, Excite at Home in these early days, and um, uh, Alibaba and TripAdvisor. Hmm. So that, I mean, it, so they felt comfortable with you being in that kind of tech world. 
But when yeah, you that your... was uh, that was lucrative because tech is the new thing in China. It's uh, uh, a lot of people want want to get into the tech industry. I was making really good money as an executive uh, in at tech tech companies. It, and and then when you decided to make this transition, I guess was it was it as challenging for you? Was it another challenge for you to sort of reveal this to them over time? The way that it was, what you know, the the challenge of revealing what you did in the film. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I at first I had to tell them it just uh, you know I'm just giving myself a break uh, to pursue my passion for a little while, and then so each time they will ask me how long you're gonna indulge yourself in this hobby of yours, uh, it just gets you know the time you just gotta extend it repetitively. Um, I it, it was I mean it's a hard decision for me as well for me to give up that uh, stability and uh, income. In in the management career to do documentary filmmaking, so uh, that's part of the reason why I moved from China to New York to be get uh, to be to get away from all of that. So you moved from China to New York. When you moved to New York, were you a full time filmmaker, or were you still tied into the tech companies? Uh, I quit my job in China and moved to New York to become a full time filmmaker. Wow, that is that is a risk. Why did why New York over LA? I, I, you know, my partner at that time, he was splitting his time between New York and Beijing. So naturally, we have a place here. So it was, you know, much easier transition for me as compared to a move to LA. And also, I knew several documentary filmmakers in the New York area. So it was a natural, more natural move for me personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you had some connections over there anyway. So yeah, I mean, yep. that makes sense. Now, your partner is also in the film with you. This is a very personal film. I mean, you are the subject of it. Um, how did he feel when you presented this idea to him that you were going to do a documentary on your life in this journey? He was, he was reluctant, but also accommodating. Uh, as you said, it's an extremely personal film. And uh, yeah, I mean, he he he's Chinese-American. He grew up here. He had... Um, he considered privacy very important to him. Mm. So I kind of pushed and nudged him into cooperating and in, into supporting this film. Was this your first documentary or were your other films documentaries as well? Uh, this is my third documentary. I made a, my first one is called The Road to Fame. That was about young kids in China's top acting school. You know, for their graduation showcase, they did American musical Fame mm. as their graduation showcase. So on stage, they play American kids who wanted to be be famous, and in real life, they want to be famous themselves as well. And my second film, People's Republic of Desire, premiered at South by Southwest and won Grand Jury there last year, is about live streaming celebrities, internet celebrities in China. So this is my third film. Oh wow. These are these are great credits, especially for a brand new filmmaker. I mean, your first film uh, being something that sort of launches your career like this is that's really really impressive. Oh, this is not my first film, right? This is my third film. No, so, I'm saying, uh, but your first film, your first film that you were just talking about, um, the 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 Road to Fame. The, oh, okay, the the one that won the South by Southwest that was my second film, People's Republic of Desire. It's yes. not. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, yes, I see. I'm sorry, I got that confused. So the Road to yeah. Fame was not the South by Southwest, but the Road to Fame was your first film. I apologize for that. But yeah. um, but but still, getting into a situation where you've you've quit your job essentially, you went right into full time f- filmmaking, and then by the time you did your next film, granted it was a few years later, getting into South by Southwest, that's a that's an extraordinary uh, opportunity. Like that's really great. You must have been oh, you, you must have been blown away by that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was very happy with that. But of course, as as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, you always wanted to do better, right? Of yeah, course. you never, yeah, you would never be satisfied to some degree. <laughs> I guess I guess that's true. <laughs> and it sounds like you know that's in your blood because your your family doesn't seem very satisfied by things either. They uh they they seem to want more and more and more. And uh, it was interesting to to see them in there. I, so same question. When I was talking about your your boyfriend being willing to be in this film, what was it like working with your family? I mean, did, did anybody in your family resist wanting to be on camera for this project? 
No, I mean, I, t- I started filming them a while ago. So they were, um, because I, like I said in my film, I had always thought my family was very unique, uh, was kind of crazy. So I started documenting that. Yeah. Obviously, right now the film is on Netflix. I, 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 I've been getting a lot of uh, email or social media messages from viewers from you know every part of the world. They, they message me and say, okay, my family remind them of their own family. So now I realize my family is actually not that unique. <laughs> Did they know that th- what you were filming was part of a documentary? Yeah, I told them I was making a documentary about my family. I didn't exactly tell them where the story is taken. But okay, first of all, I started filming before the surrogacy process really started. Okay. So they were they have been used to me having a camera around the house filming them, you know. And uh uh once I started we started the surrogacy process, it, for them it's just a continuation of my inquiries about my family's reaction to my life. So they were very used to it. Now, what does this do to a person? I mean, if you're not getting positive reinforcement uh for really any of the uh, or any of the endeavors that you went for in your life, becoming a filmmaker, of course, um, coming out as gay, this project that you're working on, what does that do to you to not have that positive reinforcement uh, or that support from your family? Does that affect you in a way or do you just kind of let it roll off you? Um, I guess that's part of the baggage of having grown up in China with Chinese parents. Um, On some level, I really hated it that they didn't respect me, didn't respect me for who I am and support me. But on the other hand, I guess different people react differently to it. Like I heavily rebelled against my parents' expectation when I was in my teens and 20s. Uh, So I think their disapproval actually pushed me to pursue what I want to do more. And also in the end, I think approaching the end of the film, I also explained that uh, despite our great differences, we finally learn to love each other, respect each other's differences, and making compromise to coexist as a family. So that, you know, having that kind of relationship also helped me grow as a human being to some degree. Near the end of the film, there's a moment where it's right near at the end where you're, you're you've sort of made the decision to not tell your grandfather. Um, and I'd love to know if you have since, uh, but you, you made the decision to kind of not tell your grandfather and you made this statement about how, uh, truth isn't always the most important thing. Sometimes you have to take into account people's feelings too. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment to explore that thought a little bit because a documentary is all about truth and to come to the realization at the end of a documentary, that truth isn't the most important thing was a very interesting thing to me. Um, I'd love to just get a little bit more insight as to where that came from and if you still feel the same. I think as we grow older, I think our views about the world tend to be more and more nuanced and we tend to recognize the complexity in a lot of issues. So when I was younger, in my teens and 20s, I would fully embrace this idea of being truthful to yourself, to assert your individuality, to um, to rebel against anything that kind of expect me to conform to any sort of social norms. Mm. I was a rebel in my youth. But I think as I get, you know, as I grow older, as I truly understand how different we truly are a lot of times and how we, our views and our values have been shaped by our different upbringings. So in the past, I tried to talk my parents into accepting my views for the longest time. But in the end, I kind of came to the realization they would never be able to change. All I could do is to find the time to be in their company, to keep them company, and to, you know, to love them regardless, just as my mom continues to love me, even though she disproves of my lifestyle, quote-unquote lifestyle. Mm. And, and I, you know, as I... So... Along this line of thoughts, I came to realize that uh, if I insist on what I consider to be truth, I will continue to hurt a lot of people's feelings, especially my grandpa, who's, 
in his 90s. What one of the common themes were, I think, in the film is this idea that you spent so much of your life trying to get the approval or or not the approval, but get your family to accept the way that you live uh, and, and accept your views. But it feels like at the end, you became more upset, uh, accepting of theirs, which I thought was a really interesting take on it. Um, yeah, that, that that's absolutely true. I think when I was younger, I was definitely rebelling against my parents. My question was always be, was always like, why couldn't they understand who I am? Why couldn't they just accept me for being who I am? But then later on, once I realized, you know, their views were shaped by their own upbringing, it's very hard for their views to change. I gradually came to view them almost as little kids. So I became a lot more patient with them. And then I think I was a lot more accommodating of their quote-unquote ignorance or um Sorry, that's not not that's not the right word to say either. Yeah, well, it's it's tricky yeah. because you're dealing with people that completely have a completely different point of view, um, but they're still managing to, you know, work with you on it. And I and I and I think that's that's interesting. There was a point in the film that really struck me too. You're all sitting around the table trying to decide what lies you're going to tell to other family and friends of the family about who these children are when you bring them back for, um, for New Year's. And that was a really fascinating scene because everyone's around the table coming up with all these lies. And some of the lies were so crazy that it's so, and so much worse than the truth. It just seemed, it seemed wild to me that that would be part of it. But it, it made me think that it's almost more important the appearance that you have uh, for other people, that you don't, you don't want people to really know what's going on. I mean, do you feel like that is... Uh, is that indicative of Chinese culture as a whole, or is that something that you just experience in your family? Uh, no, I think that's, you, you know, you pointed out correctly, that's pretty indicative of the Chinese culture in general, because Chinese culture is very conscious about face, about saving face. It's all about how you appear to the others. Um, so for them, uh, the appearance of having a wife, having a quote-unquote normal family is of paramount importance. Uh, even if the the wife something happened to her, right, you know, uh, that's of secondary importance. Rule Boston Camera is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment for two reasons, two big reasons. One, they have a gigantic world class inventory of rental gear. So, cameras, audio, lighting, grip, communications, everything you could imagine, a huge selection of lenses. It's all there at Rule. Dot com. The other thing is their service. Think about it. Production is mission critical, right? You're renting because you don't own. And if you don't own, you probably aren't as familiar with the equipment as you are with the stuff that you do own. So you want to make sure when you leave, you know exactly what it is that you purchased and how to use it. So you're going to get the best service in the business, expert advice and, and counsel in pre-production, technical guidance when you take the equipment out on your shoot, and they're committed to support you while you're on location. All of this equals peace of mind, and that sort of service and that level of uh, attention is really why I keep going back to rule. They're fantastic. I'm certainly not the only one. Everybody in the everybody around Boston's using them all the time, from super high-end Hollywood features all the way down to small, low-budget things, and it's because they are the best in the business when it comes to service. So inventory service, it's all there at rule.com. So learn more about them at their website, rule.com. And lastly, let's talk about Shutterstock for a moment, shall we? Shutterstock.com has over 15 million royalty-free video clips, and a lot of them are in 4K. So have no fear, all you 4K editors. But it, it's it's really the the quantity is certainly important. You want to go somewhere that has a lot of variety, but it's the quality that makes Shutterstock stand out. And when you want to talk about quality, you really have to go to their Shutterstock Select section because this is the best that Shutterstock has to offer. This is blockbuster quality at really, really great prices. You get exceptional quality. So this is premium, highly curated footage captured in up to 8K by leading filmmakers. They're using cutting-edge gear. So this is shot with the latest technology, including RED cameras, Zeiss Master Primes, and more. And as far as pricing goes... 
All of the Shutterstock Select Clips are $3.99 and include unlimited worldwide use. Now, when I tell you, this is the cream of the crop. This is the best that Shutterstock has to offer. It's cinematic, it's beautiful, and that's what you want when you're looking for stock footage. You want something that is going to enhance your project. And you certainly are going to find that at Shutterstock.com, especially in the Shutterstock Select section. So head over there, go to Shutterstock.com, hover over footage, scroll down to Shutterstock Select, and enjoy. I want to talk logistically about the film a little bit. So you decide you're going to be your own subject. Are you shooting a lot of this film as well? Yeah, this uh, this film, the majority of it was shot by by me uh, by myself. And the only time I used uh, I used the cameraman was when I took the kids back to China for Chinese New Year. Uh, obviously, I was interacting a lot with my relatives. I couldn't hold a camera and hold my kids at the same time. Sure. So that's the time. That's the only time I hired a cameraman. Now, it, do, did you shoot your previous documentaries? That's right. So for People's Republic Desire, my previous film, I think I shot 60, 70% of it. Mm. And The Road to Fame, same thing? You shot most of yeah. that? Yeah, The Road to Fame, I shot 50% of that. I, I split my responsibility with another cameraman. When you're shooting a documentary, you're... you're you know, it, it's not your story. You're si you're sitting there, you're away from the story, you're just sort of letting it unfold, and what you want is truth and honesty at all moments. When it's your own story, was that challenging? Like, did you feel, you know, self-conscious about putting out so much of your truth into this film? No, no, no. It, 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 I wasn't very conscious when I was doing the production, because, um, you know, as a, doing the production, just follow whatever is happening. Uh, as I would film any... Um, and other films, except I was involved, right, in the scene. Yeah. And so but a lot of the conflict, a lot of the thinking about whether I'm capturing truth, whether I'm affecting truth, what, what my role is, I think that that came during the post-production, the editing process, rather than during production. I think the challenge of being a one-man band is the same, but pretty similar when I was filming People's Republic Desire, which was, you know, me filming internet celebrities doing their live streaming shows in their bedrooms versus me talking to my parents, um, you know, or filming them uh, eating a meal. Uh, a lot of the challenges are the same. I actually, it was a lot more challenging to be doing your own sound recording and be your own cameraman, um, you know, be a one-man band. That, 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 that kind of challenge exists across all my films for so, me. So you were predominantly a one-man band. Can you, can you talk to me a little bit about the the equipment that you were using? What were you shooting on? Oh, for this film, I actually uh, just used the, the C100. Oh, wow. Uh, I had Great. a C100 a few, few years back, and when I started doing the um, People's Republic Desire, once I got funding, I was considered to switch cameras, but then I decided probably it's best just continue using the same camera. And uh, the production of uh, All In My Family and the People's Republic of Desire overlapped, so I was using the same camera. Now, what what was was there? I guess what can you tell us about that camera that worked really well for your workflow? Was it the size of it? Was it uh, you know the the look of the footage that worked for you, or maybe just the fact that you owned it? But why did you decide on that camera? I I just like the size of it. It's very, and also the ergonomics as a one man, one man band. It was really easy to use. I tried to switch it to C three hundred. I I it's just a, a a lot more bulkier compared to C one hundred. Yeah. So I, I never, I didn't get end up making the switch in the end. And what were you using for your audio to capture your audio in this? Oh, I mean, there's always a shotgun mic on the, on the camera itself. And also I laugh, I laugh the people I'm following. I also, I usually have two laughs. Uh, one laugh is on the subject of the main subject of the scene. And I, there's all usually a second laugh hidden somewhere on the table or in the center of the scene itself. So usually I have three audio captures from any shoot. So now, did you light any of your scenes or is it all just naturally lit in the environments you're in? I didn't, you know, as a one-man one bear, I didn't have time to light any scenes. And also being, you know, most of my, um, other than the interview shots, everything else just happened in, 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 in real time. Um, 
So I didn't have time to light my scenes, but usually I do. I did pay some attention to the lighting. Sometimes, for example, like open the curtain, open or drawing the curtains, or keep some lights on or lights off, just to you know. And also, some of the lighting man- manipulation happened during post production, during color grading. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the post production process. So first, how long were you shooting this film? This film was shot on and off during a two year period. Uh, since uh, we um, started the surrogacy process, you know, until after the both kids have turned one, we took the kids back to China. So that's over two years on and off. Mm-hmm. Okay. So were you editing kind of along the way or did you wait until all the footage was captured and then you did one large editing period? I had two periods of editing. The first one was... Uh, I got enough footage, I started making a trailer. That's right around the time my first kid was born. So I looked through all the footage I had. I made a five-minute, just long trailer. That's the one I showed to potential founders. And then I didn't do any editing until I finished all the shots and sat down and, you know, just edited the film in a three-month, over a three-month period. So a three-month period. So so now... Before the film was the before the film was finished, you had created this little trailer, and you were using that to get funding. You were saying, "Did I hear that right?" That's correct. Okay, so I guess what is that process like to get this movie sold? It's on Netflix now, but I'd love to learn a little bit about how you you know went from making the film. Now you're in post production. What are your steps to get this to the next place? Um. <laughs> So the the uh, I pitched this film to Netflix at a Sundance event. Uh, my last film, People's Republic Desire, was invited to a couple of Sundance labs, and one of the lab there were some Netflix ex- executives there. So I pitched to one of them who happened to have grown up in an immigrant family. Mm. So she immediately, you know, see her own mother in my mom, and she liked the project. So we just basically continued the discussion, and pretty soon afterwards, uh, Netflix decided to, um, you know, acquire the film as a, a Netflix original. So I was really lucky in that way because I really didn't spend that much time um, pitching my film for funding yet, because I was still trying to wrap up People's Republic Desire. I didn't have that much energy to really go around to do the grant application uh, for another film while finishing a feature-length documentary. This is such a, it's, it's an industry that I'm so unfamiliar with because what I do on my, at my production company is commercial work. So we, we, you know, we're not out there pitching to get funding for things. We're, you know, we're working with ad agencies and and working with directly with businesses. So it's a completely different world for me. And I, I, you know, it would be great if you could offer some tips to our audience about ways to navigate that process of making the film. And then what happens after it, like how, what's the best way to start getting into the rooms with these people that need to, uh, that you need to know in order to get your project sold? The, the distribution, the, fun, the funding and distribution of documentary film is a somewhat complicated subject. So usually uh, you want to raise money even in the, as early as possible during the production. Yeah. So what you do is that as you go to production, you need to, edit a scissor reel, you need to prepare some uh, selected scenes for funders to look at, and then you go around sending out the grant application and try to get as much money as possible. And there are the usual suspects like Ford Foundation, Sundance, or Tribeca that give out film grants. And there, there, there are also, uh, you know, broadcasters like PBS or BBC or the Arte and that uh, they can give you funding in exchange for some broadcast rights. There are also equity financiers like Impact Partners um, that can give you funding in in exchange for equity positions in your film in your films. So it's 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 complicated to navigate. So for people who are not familiar with how to fundraise and how to distribute um, documentary films, uh, usually. You know, you have to start um, working with some more experienced, more established executive producers who can help you navigate this world. Mm. 
Is there a resource online that people can go to to learn more about this process? I mean, I'm I'm thinking the person that's listening that has no connection to EP executive producers that are you know they have a they have a great story they want to tell. They can even create the story entirely by themselves. I mean, you did it as a one man band, but then what's next? You know that that I would love to fill that gap for people and give a little bit of advice and direction to where they can go to start learning how to get their films out there. Oh yeah, there are a lot of the online resources um, to what do you, recommend? you know, um, like POV. Po- POV is a prestigious documentary strand on P- PBS. POV has a great website um, for filmmaker resources where you can go to find out all the different uh, funding organizations and the first the list of document that showcase documentaries. Uh, and then there are many many blog posts online about how to you know how to found and distribute documentaries as well. So this POV, I'm looking at it now, pbs.org forward slash POV. Uh, and, and this is a good resource to learn about, or, or is, this, is this a program that, um, that PBS has? No, it's a, it's a, it's a strand, TV strand. Oh, okay. Uh, that showcases independent documentaries. I understand. Okay, so this is, a place where, this is a place where you can have your documentary shown. Yeah, but they also have public, uh, they also have a filmmaker resources website that just basically provides a lot of reference, inf- uh, a lot of information for uh, information for filmmakers that they can use. Uh, they can educate themselves about how to fund and produce and distribute independent documentary films. So we've got the pbs.org forward slash POV. Is there any other resources that you think would be a good place for you know our audience to start if they want to learn more about how to get their documentary out there? Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, there are a lot of filmmakers who are publishing blog posts and they share knowledge on their personal website. Uh, one of the sites I use pretty often when I first got, to, uh, got into this industry is a website called dword, d-w-o-r-d.com. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's a website of bulletin boards. People can just post questions and other filmmakers, uh, you know, frequently will answer those questions for you to help you guide to, 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 to the right resources. Uh, I find that website extremely helpful. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called Seven Seas by Immersive Music. Premium Beat is where to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. Head over to premiumbeat.com to access a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as $49 each. But you don't just get the individual song, you get cutdowns, loops, stems. And what that means is full and complete customization to fit your project perfectly. But it's all about quality, and that's what you get at premiumbeat.com. So head over there, check it out for yourself. Check out this song, Seven Seas by Immersive Music, and see what else they have to offer. Premiumbeat.com. And lastly, let's talk about Magnanimous Rentals. Magnanimous Rentals is a rental house based in Chicago that ships anywhere in the country. They get a great inventory, but really what they are all about is being the best priced place in the business. And they really are. They're kind of obsessed with pricing. Let me, let me explain. You go to their site and their regular prices are fantastic. So just off the bat, you've got great prices regularly. Then they have these flash discounts, which are limited time, steeply discounted items. And they do it all the time. So you've got to check their site, magrents.com all the time to see what's going on. But the flash discounts are amazing, but they're for a limited time. So you got to be on top of that. Then they also have blue prices that are dynamic prices, and these are auto-lowered below the regular price. They change every day. So again, you have to go to Mag Rents all the time to find out what's going on over there. It's like a little surprise every every time you go to magrents.com. They're going to beat any price there is posted online, and just that that's just what it's about, the best prices in the business. So if you want the best prices you can possibly get on production equipment that you can rent and have shipped to your home, MagRents.com is where to go. Now, did Netflix fund this project as it was happening, or is that something that you 
uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to figure out the timeline here. So you started filming, you made the sizzle reel, Netflix was interested. W did they start funding the remaining part of the film? This film is a personal documentary. So I was, you know, whenever I have time to visit my family, I film it. So yeah. by the time the Netflix acquisition came about, I pretty much have, had wrapped up the production phase. But I, 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 you know, I didn't start the post-production phase yet. So the, the money really helped support me through the post-production phase of this project. So now it goes out on Netflix. Was there an immediate reaction? Like, did things change right away for you? Because Netflix has such a huge international reach. It's, a, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's really refreshing to work with Netflix um, distributing this film. With people, People's Republic Desire... You know, the film screened uh, in theatrically. It went to the iTunes, Amazon Prime, and, you know, also went to PBS, right? Uh, the, the film, P People's Republic Desire, was uh, broadcasted on PBS in early March. But then the release strategy was always piecemeal. And also in one country, then another, then another. But with Netflix, it's a, it's a, it's a global release on the same day. Yeah. Um, I've been getting so many emails from viewers from, you know, different countries. And it, the, 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 the kind of instant gratification as a filmmaker to see your film being watched, being appreciated by a global audience, this is something very new and very gratifying to me. Mm. What were some of the challenges that you faced making your documentaries? Uh, you've done three now. Um, we're certainly talking about All in My Family, but You've also had others. Uh, were, there, were there lessons that you learned from the first two documentaries that you took with you on this third one? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, as, I, as with each new film, I, I think I've become a better editor. Uh, I mm. always edit my own films. Um, in, the last, in the first film, I co-edited it and learned from my great mentor friend, slash friend, Jane Chan, with The Road to Fame. I co-edited with her. But with People's Republic Desire, I edited that. And with All in My Family, the editing process just be, um, um, have, has become a lot faster. So uh, that's why, even though it's a 40-minute film, there's a lot of story built into it. Even with that, I was able to finish editing in two and a half months, pretty much. No. Um, and uh, I... I've also learned how to approach founders, how to pitch my project a lot better. Um, so the founding cycle with each film, probably it, you know, it becomes shorter and shorter as well. Mm. That's also something I learned. Well, what goes into a successful pitch? Because now you've, you've probably pitched a few of these things. What are the necessary elements of a pitch to make it the most successful, do you think? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, a, a successful pitch needs to include a very unique, attention-grabbing story, access to great characters, and the person who, who's pitching the, the story has to have a great, convincing, confident delivery mm. in order to impress the, uh, the whoever you are pitching the story to. I, I'm, I can only imagine you have very little time during these pitches. I mean, you have to you have to get it down to. Uh, you know, a pretty quick presentation. It's my, it's my guess. I mean, I'm, I haven't been in those situations, but I know in my world, in advertising, you really don't have a lot of time to explain what your vision is. You have to do it pretty quickly. And um, I'm assuming it's very similar in your world too. Yeah, I'm, th that's absolutely right. Um, but in my world, we, a lot of times we go to pitching forums. Um, there are, um, the pitching forum are events uh, organized by some entity that have selected projects uh, for these pitching forums. And each project will have seven, you know, 10 to 15 minutes in order to showcase your project to a lot of different founders. So that's a great opportunity for you to show a, a sizzle reel and to talk about the film to a big group of people. That's how you get their attention because, you know, these Pitching Forum organizers have already pre-selected th these projects and they have invited all these different founders to sit in the same room listening to your pitch. That's interesting. So this forum, they've, 
So uh, do you get invited to the forum? Is that how that works? Or is that something that you apply to? You have to apply to it. It's actually really hard to get into these uh, pitching forums because so many people are applying. I can imagine, yeah. And are these sort of through the film festivals that we all know, or is this something, uh, are these through separate organizations, or like, where where is this? These pitching forums are usually affiliated with uh, film festivals. Like, the biggest one is with International Documentary Festival of Amsterdam, ITFA. Mm-hmm. ITFA, IDFA. IDFA forum is the largest one. The second one is... Um, affiliated with Hot Docs, which is the largest uh, documentary festival in Toronto. And, you know, they're pitching... F- uh, Sundance does its own somewhat different... organizes its own somewhat different pitching forum. Tribeca does that too. So there are a lot of pitching forums uh, happening worldwide. Now, so you're you're invited into this pitch forum. I'm fascinated by this now. So you've been invited into the pitch forum you're presenting with a whole bunch of other people that are trying to get their films out there. What is it? What is it like? Like, are you standing in front of a whole room full of potential investors and you just kind of stand? Is it like an American Idol audition? <laughs> like, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Uh, it's usually, I mean, depends on the pitching, pitching forum. There, there's a variety of, uh, I, I mean, the traditional ones are usually the filmmaker, almost like a giving a sales presentation on stage. You know, he, it's almost like a TED Talk. So you're okay, on stage okay, yeah. showing a video and then talk about your film and then your audience sitting, um, listening to, to your pitch can then ask you questions and give their opinions. And But there's also one-on-one pitching. So the, the, the event organizer will put you, will match you with 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 potential founders who are interested in the story you're working on. So you pitch them to them one-on-one. Wow, what a great opportunity. My God, to get into that room. I mean, that in and, uh, in and of itself is such a challenge. It, it is. And once you get there, I think, um, I mean, I think the pitching forum, each time they select maybe 15 to 30 projects every year. So it's pretty selective, the type of project they select. Uh, this screen. So now your relationship with Netflix and this new film, I I've heard by a lot of people that Netflix notoriously does not give people numbers. So they won't tell you, I don't know if this has changed, but I've heard that they don't tell you how many downloads you've had. Um, have you, do you have any indication of how well the film is doing? And have you sort of already been approached by them to do your next project? <sighs> Um, no, I have no idea how the film is doing. Yeah, <laughs> I think Netflix is really uh, protective of its own data, and uh, sec- yeah, I've also been talking to them to trying to find if there's any other projects we can work together on. Yeah, that means there's, what... there's only been said discussions so far. I love that. How are they to work with? I, I love them. They they give great notes. The you know the people I work with at Netflix. They've given me great feedback on my cuts. So they were really guiding me along the same, um, along the whole process. Did they really allow you to have creative control over this or did they kind of get involved and shake things up a lot? No, I think they were really respectful. I mean, I work with PBS. I, I'm, now I've worked with PBS. I've worked with uh, BBC. I also work with the Netflix. I think all of these um, um Industry executive, they're very respectful of independent filmmakers' visions. They always give me notes, but in the end, if I insist on um, realizing my own vision, they, they 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 all let me. I want to just take a few minutes here at at the end of our interview and talk just about your life and how it's been affected by becoming a father. Now, I mean. I'm I'm invested in your life now after spending 40 minutes with you this morning learning about, <laughs> you know, watching the film and learning about it. I mean, I think this is a challenge that a lot of people face is they are filmmakers, they are creators, um, which in some ways is very selfish because you're it's an all consuming job and it can become it can become your child. It can become the most important thing in your life, especially when you're yep. doing something very personal. Now, to have something that actually is the most important thing <laughs> to arrive, and two of them, you, you had two, uh, yeah. how did that affect your, your career? Did it, wh- how did it change it? 
How did it change your perspective on your work? Uh, I used to be a workaholic. I used to to just work around the clock. But now, obviously, with kids, I can't anymore. Every morning, I have to send them to school. And, you know, in the evening, I have to feed them, bathe them, and do their bedtime. So I don't have as much time as before. Um, but at the same time, I guess it just pushed me to be more productive, to be more focused when I'm, when I'm actually working. Mm. Uh, there's definitely a lot of compromise I, I have made, I will continue to make, just because I'm a father. But I think, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm dedicated to my work, but I, work is not the only thing I'm pursuing in my life. I think to, through my work, through parenthood, I would like to become a better human being. And that's far more important than winning some awards through my work. Hmm. Has this film that you made about your family affected the way that you're going to be raising your own? Yeah. I mean, through, make, through the process of making this film, I really understood how my parents loved me despite their, you know, uh, despite our differences. Uh, I think the the only thing I can, I w- the most important thing I would like to relate to my friends is, you know, the unconditional love from the par- from the parents. I just want, want them to feel the same way I feel loved by my own parents. Hmm. Ha- has the relationship with your parents changed since the film has been released? Have they seen the film? They've seen the film. I mean, they didn't object to it, so that's a great relief. I told them this film is has been, you know, uh, is online for audiences in 190 countries to see. And, you know, they they didn't feel particular, they didn't particularly celebrate that fact, or did, they also didn't say anything negative about it. So with that, I feel content enough. Mm. <laughs> that, you know, knowing your family for the, the short period of time this morning watching the film, that does not surprise me. Um, I think one thing that's really great about this film is that it's, it is just so honest. I mean, your family is hilarious. They're really funny to watch. There's a lot of heart there. Your mother is a character. She's fantastic. Just the honesty there is great. Like you, you've been able to really capture, I think the essence of all families in yours. And it's, it's interesting because you went into this thinking that your family was so unique, but I watched your family and I'm like, Oh my God, there is so many similarities between what you guys do around the table and what we do around the table. It's very, very interesting <laughs> to me. I'm so happy to hear that. Family, the, the challenges of families is universal, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> it certainly is. Well, I absolutely love the film and I'm so happy you came on to talk to us about it. Uh, what's next for you? I'm still talking to uh, uh, several production companies about uh, possible projects. Not these for sure yet. Ah, can you talk? Can you tell us anything about it? Is there any? No, I think it's too early. It's still or in the um, you know sort of like research stage. Yep. I think it's too early to tell. So maybe later this year I will be able to share with you some of the projects I will be working on. Oh, I love that. Well, I think the film is fantastic. It's called All in My Family. It's on Netflix right now. So go check it out. No matter where you live, no matter where you're listening to us. Uh, I know we have a lot of international uh, listeners as well. So you guys go to your Netflix accounts, check out All In My Family. It's a really great film. It's a short film, only 40 minutes. So you can get through this real quick and um, check out his other work as well. I, I'm I'm a real big fan of what you're doing. I think the honesty you brought to this is great. And it's, it's it was just a lot of fun watching you interact with your family and learn from it. Oh, thank you so much, man. There he goes, Hao Wu, director of the new film, the Netflix original documentary, All in My Family. It's such a good film, you guys. It's short, too. It's like less than an hour. Just really well done. So I want to thank Hao for being on the show and sharing his experience. I also want to thank Matt Russell because he mixes and masters and makes this show sound so good. You can hire him for your own projects, which is really cool for all of you. You can find him online at gainstructure.com, gainstructure.com, and on Twitter, at gainstructure. Of course, you can tweet us as well, at Go Creative Show. Find us on Facebook, at Go Creative Show. We post a lot of stuff there. And let us know what you think of the show. 
Who do you want on? You can interact with our guests on there, too. So there's a lot going on on the Facebook page. I also want to thank our sponsors, Hedge.Video, Rule Boston Camera, Magnanimous Rentals, Shutterstock, and Premium Beat. Without these people, we wouldn't exist. So support those that support us, and we'll see you next week.